Hi everyone, welcome to the June 2019 licensed staff meeting. Um, I am Jessica Baumgarten and I am the Director of Nursing here at Valley Elder Care and I'm very excited to give this my first attempt at a online meeting or a meeting on Healthcare Academy. So the reason that some of you may be wondering why we're doing it this way is because we've had a lot of adverse events lately that have required um, you know, us explaining and re-explaining some processes. When I looked back at who it is that I am explaining things to as far as from nursing staff, they are nurses that are um, not coming to meetings and so I need to really make this a priority. So going forward, we're gonna have a new process for our licensed nurse meetings. Uh, there'll be three sessions recorded each month. They'll hopefully be on a recurring schedule. I'm trying to work on uh, room schedules for this so that I can have it set so that you have time to plan ahead to make sure that you're able to get to these meetings. Healthcare Academy is what is going to be available if you do not attend in person. So you will have one week to attend, a, um, if you do not attend the live session, to review this PowerPoint every month. And we will um, make sure to document that you did review it. At the end of each session, you'll have to sign a um, statement that says, you know, you agree and understand the information to or you understand the information that's been presented. One of the one thing though is that there's only you can only do a maximum of four healthcare academy recordings per year. The other eight meetings you do need to be on site and into um, during one of the scheduled meetings. And the reason that I am choosing to go this route is because it is a lot better for our nurses and all of us to generate conversation if we're in person. So this whole change will be as a result of us of me wanting you guys to be accountable for the changes and you know it it's um it's a challenge at times for the other nurses who always come to the meetings to it, it shouldn't be the expectation that they're the ones to relay all the information so um if you have any questions on that let me know we are going to be looking at changing our policy from um, eight per year to 12 per year so just because we do have so much information that is so important and this has to become a priority as professionals in the nursing field we have to continue to be seeking extra knowledge, be continuing to work on advancing our careers and advancing our knowledge and, you know, being able to supervise and do our jobs as a nurse in the best way possible. I look forward to this change. I also look forward to seeing and hearing from all of you. Comms. VT has been using the new version of comms and this has been going well for the Medicare residents. And so what this is, this is a set of comms um, that is a little bit more streamlined. The older version that we started with, you had to go in and out of each section and click on one section to the next. And that actually got to be a little bit challenging um, because it did seem more time consuming. So um, as we go forward, the new version of comms will be used on all Medicare residents. The older version comms 4.0 will be used on any resident that needs any sort of monitoring, such as status weekly, etc. Um, and the other thing that we're going to work towards is starting July 5th, every resident will have a comms assessment in this facility. The reason for that, which would be our original comms, is because when you pay $9,000 a month to live here, we should have a weekly assessment at the very least for these residents. So as a family member, I should be able to come in and say, you know, I want to know how mom did last week. Well, we might not have anything in the chart as of right now, but this will be a good way to keep us on on top of things, being able to look back at assessments, um, and really just holding us accountable to making sure that we are assessing and monitoring care. Um, we were supposed to have the Valley Elder Care picnic this week. Uh, unfortunately, that got rescheduled to July 11th. But the reason I have this in here is because I want to make sure that all of you go to this picnic because it is crucial that we are going because you guys are such a big part of this. The families and residents, you know, they have the best time and that's all because we volunteer. So, you know, for management, for instance, they are require, I require them to be there from four to seven. So if you see signups on your neighborhoods, make sure that you're going through and that you are signing up and that you're coming to give some of your time. I realized for some it's after hours, but you know, if you're volunteering, um, it's great. If you decide to sit down and assist a resident or transfer or do whichever, then you just need to fill out a town slip and we will pay you for that time. So let's, you know, we can't pull these um, events off without you guys. So let's make sure that we're all participating and able to 
um, and volunteer and give the residents the best night that we can. So bed alarms and chair alarms have been a big topic as of late. And so I wanted to put this in here so you guys were able to see how a bed alarm and chair alarm that is connected together functions and is functioning, how that's set up. So as you can see, we have a bed alarm and a chair alarm and the chair alarm is a wireless pad which has a transmitter in it. That transmitter is what's used to signal the monitor for us to, re or to relate to us that this resident is moving or getting up out of their chair. When you have someone with a bed alarm and they sit in their recliner, I would make sure to put a chair alarm in as well because we know that they're not going to just fall from their bed. Uh, with the kits now, so Kate has come up with a bed alarm and a chair alarm kit, and these are kept in the clean utility rooms along with nursing supplies. And the nice thing about these kits is anything you need to set up a bed alarm is in there. So you don't have to worry about um, grabbing all the right pieces and, and whatnot, because in order to have two, you actually have to have a splitter um, because you can't plug both of them into the wall without that. So if you're questioning how to do this, um, there are pictures in each kit. Sue will be restocking the kits. I believe it's every Friday. And then if you do run out of a kit or you don't have one, leave her a note or put it on the We Are Out of form and Sue will go ahead and get that all replaced so that you have more. There will be more in the back. Another thing I wanted to point out with this is that the bed alarm pads are good for a year. The chair alarm pads, however, are good for 45 days. So make sure that when you guys are going to throw these pads away after 45 days, that you're taking the transmitter out because that little gray box that's the transmitter on the chair alarm is actually good for two years. So we could continue to use those um, as we replace pads. Um, another place to find this information is in the licensed nurse how-to guide on each neighborhood and on the O drive. So make sure you're taking a peek at that so that you're able to able to, excuse me, have a reference if you're looking at how to um, set up a bed and chair alarm. Staffing, uh, staffing by census. So many of you have seen our census has been quite a bit lower over the last month. We've had roughly 15 to 20 beds down. And just as a reminder that this is a, this is a situation where it's a moving target and we are constantly adjusting staffing. But you do have to remember that I can't justify um, overstaffing at this point because of our census being so low. So we have to be fiscally responsible when we're um, making decisions like that. You know, it can be anything from looking at the call lights to the length of the time the calls are on, the number of call lights, and just the overall number of lifts and whatnot. And so we adjust and we move people around to meet the need, but just know that I can't fill every neighborhood with extra people at this point. Um, but one of the things I do want you guys to think about is when you guys are really stressed out about the call lights and how your neighborhood is and if it's too heavy and they're doing, you know, they're working so hard, what role are you playing in that anxiety or that cause for increased um, stress levels on that neighborhood? And we always have to take a moment and self-reflect a bit just to say, you know, I probably didn't need to act that way. Because when it is, you know, a stressful day and it's always stressful when you're here, we also have to take a step back and think, okay, are we supporting you well enough? But also, are you self-reflecting and figuring out ways to make this a better situation? Be creative out there with your staff. You know, just because we've had five groups and eight residents on each group, I mean, if there are, some are heavier than others and you want to switch them up a little bit, you know, you can do that. Just make sure that it's, you know, updated in most places. But, you know, don't live in your own misery. Continue to figure out solutions and strive to make your days better each day while you're here, regardless of how stressful it might be. Um, dress code. So what this is for you, why I have this in here for you is because it, I need to talk about what our dress code consists of. So we have a walkie-talkie, a gate belt, an iPod, a name tag, and scrubs. Now this is your typical CNA's five things that they need to have. So when I see someone without a name tag, I will always ask, where's your name tag? And it's almost unfortunate that no one else has asked that prior to me because I know they've been seen by quite a few people. But again, these five things are not optional. Leggings are not part of the dress code. You can send people home or you can go in the back to get um, scrubs for them. But again, we need to make sure that we are utilizing these 
tools that we have in place so that we have them. We've had falls that have occurred without a gate belt. Um, we've had communication that's lacked because of walkie talkies. We've had people who have turned their walkie talkies off. We've had people who um, continue to not respond to people with walkie talkies. And, you know, there's not a whole lot we can do when the dress code isn't followed. So that's why we we require you guys to take the lead. And you know what, if they're not meeting dress code, then we need to do some stuff about that. We need to start a care form, start a positive discipline process and hold them accountable for that. Just like I hold you all accountable for your dress code. Um, and if you have any questions on that or how to write somebody up for dress code, please let me know. Uh, iPods, to go into this, just so you guys are all aware that carrying an iPod is not is not an option. Um, it has to be carried. We did have an adverse event out on a neighborhood where the CNA did not carry an iPod and um, said that they had just written down everything that they needed to know for their shift while the resident ended up falling. And this then turns into, um, thankfully there was no injury, I should say. Otherwise, if there would have been an injury, it would have been a potential uh, abuse or neglect, which then could have been reviewed by the North Dakota Department of Health which then could have led to the removal of a CNA certification. So that's what happens when CNAs don't carry them. They have to have access to that card X at all times. When you do have a resident who falls and the CNA reports it to you, and when you're trying to figure out how the fall happened, I would make sure to ask them two, two questions. Do you have your iPod? And do you know how to access a card X? Because once you know those two things, then you can decide whether or not it was like, a, oh, I know everything. I don't need to look at the iPod. Or if it was truly because they didn't have the education to use or to run the iPod. So keep those things in mind. Again, iPods are not optional. It is their key to knowing how and when and what a resident needs. And we need to make sure that we're setting that standard for them. Call lights. Uh, well, call lights have improved. There's still a little bit of room for more improvement. We are seeing, you know, the numbers in April were really, really high. We had, I think, over 75 call lights that were greater than 20 minutes. And we also have had multiple, you know, they've been more improved, but also our census is lower. So we still have to keep this as a really big deal for when we are um, working our shifts. One other thing, too, is the call light review form. So we've shortened that form up a little bit for you guys. We're going to continue to try and do that. But what I want you guys to think about is if the CNAs are filling out where they were at during this call light, read where they're saying. I had actually reviewed a call light review form from a neighborhood and it was 6.20 in the morning and the light was on for 40 minutes. When I started reviewing the form at, that I had gotten, everyone was in a room helping people. The last person was in a room, or excuse me, was in the dining room at 6.20 a.m., so what were they doing for those 40 minutes in the dining room when that's not breakfast time or what? So when you're looking at those like reasons and locations of where they were, you might have to do a little digging and a little investigating to get to the bottom of it to understand why they weren't able to answer that light. On the flip side, though, nurses need to not be complacent to the, the lights going off. You can't be complacent to the alarms. You have to continue to listen for them, and you have to continue to set the example that you can answer the light. There's nothing more frustrating to a CNA than when you go answer a light or ask someone else to answer a light or not just carry out the task. I try to answer, you know, as many lights as I can, and I get it. We're all busy, but we do have to make time for that. So, again, keep up the good work with the call light improvement, but, you know, make sure each other are, make sure you remind each other that this is an important area and that we just can't let this go um, lax. Uh, pharmacy concern forms. So whenever you have a concern with a pharmacy, you need to make sure you route me that blue pharmacy concern form. The reason I need these forms is because once I get them, I'm able to scan them in and send them to the pharmacy. But it also shows that we want to work together with these pharmacies. And then we need to make sure that we're developing the relationships as well so that our residents receive high, the highest quality of care. Another thing to think about with this is if you order a medication from, let's just say, Thrifty White, because that's our PCC um, connection. If you order medications and they don't come, who's responsible for that? Is it you because you ordered them? And what did you do to make sure that that medication was going to come? So if I work two days, three days a week and I'm gone for four days, but I've ordered a medication, 
I would expect that you guys would report that off to the next shift and the next shift would then assume responsibility to say, did this medication come? We cannot be charting in a MAR, a number nine that says med not available because we didn't do everything we could to get that med. So we need to make sure that we're passing along and having just a quick little huddle or report at the end of the day that says, these are the meds that I've ordered. Can you please double check that they've come? If they don't make it, then the pharmacy needs to be called. They have online pharmacists for a reason. So make sure that you guys are following through with that and keeping the pharmacies accountable as well. PRN antipsychotic and anti-anxiety medications. This is kind of a review. And some of this stuff may be a review for you in this presentation, but it's a very important topic. So we have antipsychotic medications, and when they are ordered PRN, they cannot be ordered any longer than 14 days, regardless, no if, ands, or buts about it. Even if they're on hospice, they still need to be reordered every 14 days. You cannot continue them. And the reason being is that uh, antipsychotics can be very you know, have a lot of side effects for the elderly, and we want to make sure we try to get people off of those medications. But if you're wanting to extend it longer than 14 days, then what I would do is ask the physician to schedule it. Otherwise, every 14 days for those antipsychotics, you're going to have to get a new order and a new script. For all other medications, such as like Ativans or any other anti or anti psychotropic meds, excuse me, you can have them reviewed at the 14 day mark and they can be extended out PRN. Again, it's just the PRN antipsychotics. The regulation does not differentiate between a regular nursing home resident and a nursing home resident who is receiving hospice. So you have to treat them exactly the same. If you have any questions on that, let me know. Skills validations, I'm hoping everybody has gotten in to get their skills validations. And just as a reminder, this is a way for us to accurately supervise the CNAs and to assist them. Yeah, I can't expect people to supervise if they don't have the same skill set. So this is a really good way for us to make sure that we are on the same page as them and that we can provide support as needed. Your PCC dashboard. So this is something that you need to be checking every shift to ensure your tasks are complete. This dashboard has got so many things on it that can be such, you know, of such great use to your day, whether it's the tasks that the CNAs have completed, whether it's your treatment nurses and where they're at with their med pass. And, you know, just looking at a lot of those things that we often just kind of forget about because if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Well, this is going to be a reminder for you that you have to check your dashboard and you have to follow up on those things that are on there because it's it's important to make sure that we're addressing if there is a no BM for five days or whatnot. Just, just make sure that you're checking that. It's got orders that need to be reviewed. It's got a you know, infection notes, high risk progress notes. There is a lot that you need to look at. So I would just keep looking at that. It is, um, like I said, very much a part of your day or needs to be part of your day. Hospital return physician rounds visits. So when we have a resident who comes back from the hospital, they need to have a physician visit on day two and then again on day seven through nine. Now this mostly applies for long-term care because Dr. Henderson, Erica, and Amaka are on VT um, quite a bit, so we don't have to worry about that. But there is a form within the provider book on the long-term care side that they need to sign that they have completed that visit. And as a reminder though, the seven day seven to nine visit, that can actually be just a conversation between you and the provider. It does not have to be an actual visit, but the provider needs to sign the sheet. Once those sheets are completed, they do get scanned into the old drive and then I keep them so that in case I should ever have to pull them up for a litigation or, you know, just a family require, request, um, et cetera. So just make sure that you guys are following those sheets. We picked these dates specifically because that was when we saw the most pain or the most, um, excuse me, the most times that people were readmitted to the hospital. So when looking at that now, we're looking at maybe having a third visit somewhere in between days nine and 30 to make sure that there is a visit in there because now we're seeing quite a few that are going back in between that time frame. Uh, as a reminder, make sure that you attach the polls to any resident's physician round sheet if they are full code. The provider will address this during their visit and they've agreed to do that. The other thing too that we're looking at for physician rounds is trying to simplify the process for the recertification rounds. So when a resident is due, so like Dr. Henderson, if he has 10 recert rounds that he needs to complete in July, we're gonna try and get those scheduled on the calendar so that we know this day he's coming, he's seen this resident. 
not only will this streamline the process for him, it'll streamline the process for you and then also for the family. So if somebody should want to come to this visit or you know come and see when the doctor is here, it'll really help build that relationship with him. So be on the lookout for that. Vital signs machines. Okay, so we've had these machines for quite some time now. And I know I, there's been some issues with it as far as like the list refreshing or, you know, whatnot. Um, but I, I wanted to make sure that we are utilizing this system to the best of our abilities because it also decreases our risk for error. So make sure that you're using this and that you're sending the orders or the vitals over to the weights and vitals tab in PCC, and then you don't have to go back in and redo it. CNAs don't need to double chart and add that into PCC. They need to just do it on the on the machine and then just have it sent over. So we are getting a lot more efficient with our uh, equipment, but our practices are still becoming pretty inefficient. So we need to stop charting triple, quadruple, you know, all of that. We just need to be doing this and trusting the machine, okay? Uh, drug destruction, beginning on August 1st, we can no longer use our septic system for the drug disposal, and the MedSafe is going to be an option for us. We are going to probably have two of these installed in the facility, and all medications can go in here. This device is, a, is governed by the DEA, so our narcotics will be able to go in there. We will be able to um, put any of our other meds. Obviously, there's a size uh, limitation, but... Mostly all of our meds could go in there. When it's full, we will call Thrifty White. Thrifty White and I will go out and we will get the box. We will put it in a, you know, tamper-proof system, and then we actually send that out and the DEA gets it. So a couple of things I've been asked about this is, well, how do you monitor diversion? I trust that everyone's doing what they need to be doing, but as far as the narcotics, those will stay on the cart for now and continue to be counted twice until Leah or Rachel were to come out. And then both of you would destroy them in the med safe. That way it's not too, you know, there's an, uh, very few people that can have access to that. When it's full, like I said, I'm able to call Thrifty White and they can send any pharmacist over and we can empty it and then put a new liner in it and we are good to go. I am working on an option for our logs and what we keep in trying to get that to streamline to something electronic. Again, for the efficiencies of everything. So. I'm working on that and we'll keep you posted. My goal for the MedSafes is to have one on VT and to also have another one out on the long-term care neighborhood somewhere so that you will be able to just not have to worry about if it is, you know, full, what, excuse me, if it's full, what we, what do we do and, and vice versa. So this goes for fentanyl patches too. Come uh, August 1st, we're not gonna be able to flush those. So we'll need to make sure that we will get this sooner than later. So this will be happening sooner than later. Insulin pens, this is a review from last month and I thought it was important enough to keep it in. Uh, it was brought to my attention that there are people in the building who are withdrawing insulin from a pen because the resident didn't like the pen or vice versa. But just as a reminder, this should not be happening. We need to order a vial or try a different needle tip if needed. If you, for some reason, do not have the insulin, make sure that you're asking for a substitution with the e-kit as well. Blood sugars, we talked about this last month too, and just, it's not appropriate to wake residents up at 4 a.m. for fasting blood sugars. And now I know what you're all probably thinking is, well, how am I supposed to get these all done before I leave? And then what I need you to do is, between the day shift and the p.m. shift, or night shift, is come up with a solution. Because what's happening is, is we are doing it based off of convenience for us not what's best for our residents. So it should never be an issue of somebody saying, you know what, they were sleeping, I didn't wanna wake them up. You know, could you please get this blood sugar for me? It shouldn't be like, well, you didn't do your job. This was your responsibility. It needs to be a, yeah, good. I'm glad they slept well. I'm glad it's, you know, they're getting that sleep that they need. Uh, I can sure grab it when they wake up. We just need to work together. Uh, the quality control checks are also now on the MAR and that has been for quite some time now, but again, some important factors that I wanted to keep in this PowerPoint. Performance appraisals, for those of you who have now received some with last year's uh, performance appraisal attached, this is so that you're able to accurately and fairly score people's performance. So take a look back at last year's when it comes with it and fairly and, and judge them fairly. You know, performance appraisals should never be a surprise. You should always know 
um, kind of the things that we need to work on and, and take it as a constructive, you know, conversation. Don't take it as, you know, they think I'm terrible at this or that. Just realize that we all have room to improve. I was using in the last meeting that I had, I had to laugh because I've been told in my performance appraisals at times that I have to watch my facial expression. And while I don't like hearing that, it is truth. I know that I need to do that. So it's just about being accountable for our actions and being able or like willing and, you know, wanting to fix them. It's not, a, it doesn't mean you're bad at anything. It just means that you have some stuff to work on. So if for some reason you don't get the old ones attached, let Leah or Rachel know, but really be, score them fairly, give them goals, ask them to set a goal for the next year. You know, what is it that they want to get much better at or what is it that they can improve on or, you know, some people it's attendance, some people it's just overall efficiency on the job. Um, there's many things that they can improve on. Foot pedals versus leg rests. So the foot pedals are on the left here. They are for people who propel. Those are now our standard. So every resident that comes in will have foot pedals. What they also have is the bags underneath the chairs now. So that's what goes in there. The kangaroo pouches um, are replacing the leg rests with the calf, or excuse me, are for the are the exception for the people who need a leg rest with a calf pad. So this would be people who have to have their legs elevated at all times, who have a hip fracture. Um, there's all sorts of different reasons for that. They can keep their kangaroo pouch, but otherwise everyone else needs to go to the foot pedals. We did have Anna, excuse me, Jane and Anna go through those and they've changed everybody out. So if you are going to make a change, it needs to be on the care plan and it needs to be specific whether or not it is uh, it whether or not it is a um, the leg rest or the foot pedals so it cannot be I use either or both or you know one or the other is fine no it needs to be specific so pay attention to what people are using and making sure that we're carrying out it uh, carrying out what's in their care pressure injuries this is also a repeat and probably will be on my presentations for the next few months because we are in the middle of a pressure injury PIP, which is a performance improvement project. So we've had an increase in our pressure injuries. So last quarter of 2018, we had four facility acquired pressure injuries. So far, the, and this slide is from last month, we had 23, but now we're closer to 27 or 28 for facility acquired pressure injuries. We recently just had a situation where we had a resident who had moved in, was on daily skin checks for a week, and on, so day eight, she had, they had identified a stage two pressure injury. So that tells me, not that I'm saying that they weren't done, I just don't think a thorough skin assessment was completed. So working at trying to get some of these things a little more streamlined for you guys to take the guesswork out of what are you supposed to write, what are you supposed to do, and making sure that we're um, preventing these pressure injuries. We did, re, uh, re, excuse me, we ordered all new mattresses for Valley Transitions, which I hear are going well. Um, but the one thing that I want you guys to focus on that I know is often missed is the tactile skin assessment. So one of the key components to a skin assessment is touch. So you have to be touching the foot, the bony prominences, you need to be checking for blanchable, areas or non-blanchable, it's extremely important as far as the continued ability to be able to prevent them. We had a situation where a resident had a diabetic ulcer on his heel. He was getting a dressing change to that heel every day, and he ended up having a stage two pressure and they developed. We should never be catching something at stage two. We should be catching it at stage one. So what you're going to see is people with active skin concerns or active skin issues will be having an increase in their skin assessments. And so those will be on uh, twice a week, um, unless it's more that's needed, but they will have skin assessments twice a week. And again, remember, those are head to toe skin assessments. That's every nook, every cranny, every fold, every, you name it, that needs to be looked at. And so when you sign that off and you say that you've done that, I trust that you have. But when you sign it off and then the next day there is a stage two that's developed, I have a hard time believing that that was done to the extent that I would expect. So 
And going forward, make sure you're doing those head to toe assessments. Make sure you are um, paying very close attention to that skin, to those bony prominences, putting those pressure uh, relieving devices in place when we've identified that they are at risk and making sure that you get it on the care plan. The huddle document is a new sheet that's been attached to your report sheets. And what this does is it tracks the uh, walkie talkie use, iPod use, gate belts, name tags, etc. So this is extremely important to have and to turn in because we are we have been seeing a lot of excuse me, a lot of uh, walkie talkies and iPods going out of the building and we just can't continue to afford to replace those because of our lack of accountability. So what this does is this keeps you more accountable to the overall um, what the CNAs are doing, how they're working, are they doing all of the, are they, are they carrying all of the requested and required equipment that they need to carry to be able to safely carry out their job. So that's actually been um, a really good uh, form that Leah has developed that has gone out. Um, it's been wonderful to see that we've had a decrease in our um, a decrease in our missing walkie-talkies and iPods. And so that's been